for a lecture on the immune system. Before we move on to the next topic, which I believe is respiratory, I think it's respiratory. Either it's respiratory or digestive, but I think it's. I'm actually I'm not sure about that. Okay, so um, one of the interesting things about our T cells that I think is is that they actually cannot, um, on their own, respond to foreign pathogens, and so they actually have to be presented. Um, so this idea is, is that T cells do not have antibody receptors. So the B cells do, so I'll put unlike B cells. So the B cells can detect if there's a foreign antigen present, but the T cells cannot on their own. And so they much, must be presented with antigens, right? So must be presented. And this is where those MHC proteins actually um, are involved as well. So not only do they give your immune system the ability to tell self from self, but they're also involved in pre presentation. And so any cell that can present an ant antigen is called an APC. So APC stands for antigen pre presenting cell. So this is my antigen presenting cell. So um, all body cells are actually capable of presenting antigens. So I'll put all body cells. And they do so using a particular kind of MHC protein, which is called class one. So class one MHC protein is used. But your body cells, um, like maybe a skin cell or a muscle cell, um, these body cells um, can only present antigens that are intracellular. So they present intracellular proteins are presented. So this is actually the mechanism by which a cell that has become cancerous can be detected by the immune system. So one of the things that is interesting about cancer cells is, is that they start producing, their, their DNA um, gets activated and they start producing proteins that are not um, normal. So through mutations, the proteins can start to become abnormal. And so cancer cells can present using their class one MHC proteins intracellular proteins that are abnormal, and then the immune system can attack those cells. So I'm just gonna put um, example here, would be cancer cells, and another type of cell that is able to do this is viral infected cells. So they present abnormal proteins on their surface. Now, from the video that we watched in lab, we also saw that there are specialized cells that can do this as well. And these specialized cells include macrophages, and a type of cell called a dendritic cell. So dendritic cells are actually associated with the surface of the body and like the inside of the body where it is exposed to um, the environment. So this is what is found in the skin, but it is also found kind of like in the linings of the body. So in the respiratory tract and the digestive tract, and they're called dendritic cells because they are many branched, okay? So these are just specialized cells that can actually engulf 
foreign um, foreign particles, foreign um, bacteria, for example, digest it and then present pieces of those extracellular proteins on the surface of their of their cell. So they use class two MHC proteins to present extracellular. proteins from foreign sources. So the macrophage can actually go in and eat a bacteria and then digest it and then take a little piece of it and present it that's on its surface. And so then it would dock to a T cell and the T cell would analyze it like a helper T cell and then the helper T cell would send out a signal that would initiate the cytotoxic T cells to come and attack those foreign cells. So in the new edition of your book online, there is a diagram that shows this process of presentation. Also, there's a table that actually just talks about the types of classes. So there's another, which I didn't mention, because I haven't quite gotten to the B cells, but B cells are also able to present antigens, but the macrophage and the dendritic cells are as well. So this is what it looks like. So remember that those macrophages have these, uh, the, in this particular, actually this is dendritic cell. So the dendritic cell has these many branches and notice that it can take in a pathogen and then intracellularly digest it and then notice how it presents it. So this is the MHC protein right there, class two. And then this is the piece of the protein right there. And it is presenting it so it docks with the T cell. And then the T cell has receptors that are able to identify that and then initiate a response. The other thing, um, in some cases, you might have foreign, or excuse me, you might have cells that would use the MHC class one, right, and present the same way. Um, by presenting to a T cell. Okay. So T cells um, can differentiate. And remember that we talked about how um, they go to the thymus to make sure that they're not going to attack um, normal healthy tissue or sense that it is uh, a foreign, right? So when we look at the, the differentiation, um, we can talk about um, how the T cells undergo clonal expansion. So clonal means that it's asexual reproduction. So what type of cell division would be clonal expansion, do you think? Mitosis. So this is an example of asexual uh, division of the cells, right? So we have the selected T cell. Okay. So this is the T cell that is um, uh, ready to um, proliferate in order to fight off an infection. So this T cell then becomes um, or differentiates into helper T cells. and cytotoxic T cells. And one more, memory T cells. Um, you know, you, you, I think the regulated T cells are a little bit different than what is being selected. So I think that they are separate from this, but that's a good question. So the helper T cells produce a chemical re or chemicals called cytokines that coordinate the immune response. They also produce a special type of cytokine called an inter or called interleukins. And I like this term better than cytokine. It's just interleukins are a type of cytokine because this means that it is a, a chemical signal between leukocytes. 
So intra would be between, and the leukin is between leukocytes. And so interleukins are something that you might hear because there's a bunch of them. There's like 36 different interleukins, and sometimes they're used medicinally to help stimulate the immune system to fight off an infection. So sometimes they use those interleukins medicinally, and so we've been able to isolate them and then use them um, to aid in uh, protecting the body. So the, this is the helper T cells are the TH ones that you see written in your book. The cytotoxic T cells are some kind, sometimes called killer T cells. Right? And we learned that they are the ones that produce the perforins and the granzymes. And then we have the memory T cells, TM. So these memory cells are long lasting. So they'll reside in the immune system for a long period of time. And so this is the whole um, basis for what is called immunological memory. And for, for them to be present, right, you've had to have been exposed to the particular antigen that can be detected by these T cells because T cells and B cells are specific to the antigens. Okay. So this is my immunological memory. So in your book, they have a diagram that shows this. Let me see if I just skip ahead, sorry. Show you the image. Okay. So this is my naive T cell. It has been presented using a dendritic cell. And then we have these activated cytotoxic T cells, and you know that they destroy and then the memory T cells, and then also the helper T cells. So in, in this particular diagram, I don't think that they um, put down the help, helper T cells. So the activated T cells are the cytotoxic T cells, and then the memory T cells that stay um, along for a long period in your body. Okay, so that is cell-mediated immunity. When we talk about B cells, we sometimes refer to this as humoral mediated immunity. Humoral means like the body's humors. This means the body's fluids, which include blood. And so the antibodies can are actually be free and floating around in the blood and also leave the circulatory system and get it out into the tissues. We secrete antibodies in our saliva and in our sweat. And also it's in the milk um, that is produced by lactating females. So when we look at the B cells, they do have antibody receptors. They can undergo clonal expansion. But when they um, uh, make copies of themselves, what they do is they produce um, antibody factories. And these antibody factories are actually called plasma cells. So I'm going to put here, the clonal expansion includes the production of plasma cells and memory B cells. So when you look at, your, at the images of the plasma cells, they all look kind of weird because they are, are drawn so that they have, they're showing that they have lots of endoplasmic reticulum. So they are secretory, they're cells that are going to be secreting. So these are antibody factories. So I'll put antibody factories. So they secrete antibodies. And these antibodies are in the shape of Ys, right? So this is um, an antibody, it looks something like this. 
But the antibody, all antibodies are identical when we look at their main structure, except for the tips. And so I'm going to just draw a little diagram here. These are the receptors. So this is the part of the antibody that is going to actually bind to the antigen. So if this is my antigen in red here, I'll just draw it, it would fit like a lock and a key into my receptor. So we actually, um, you actually had a diagram that you labeled in lab, right? That was based upon this clonal expansion after being presented with a specific type of antigen. So in this diagram, I would label this one. That is my antigen. And this is my antibody. Okay. Now it's really important to realize that antibodies are not the same thing as antibiotics. And we're gonna talk about antibiotics in a minute. So antibodies are not antibiotics, right? So antibodies always have this shape for one thing, and they actually don't destroy anything, but they can neutralize it. And they can also kind of signal to the immune system to come and destroy it, right? So antibiotics are chemicals that kill bacteria or inhibit their production specifically um, so um, they can't um, overrun. So we can use antibiotics to treat bacterial diseases because they destroy the bacteria or prevent them from reproducing. We can use antibodies medicinally. So for example, you can get serums in, put into your body um, that contain antibodies that are designed to um, fight off a particular infection. But generally, that is not as commonly used as antibiotics, right? Okay. So in your book, there is a diagram showing the, the uh, three-dimensional structure of the antibody, and then that it has these different areas and that, it's, that are common, and then the, the, um, the most variable region is at the tip. So the study of how our uh, DNA can code for all these different antibodies is really interesting because if you think about it, we do not know what type of antibodies we, or antigens we are gonna be exposed to. So we have to be producing these antibodies very um, um, variable, right? So we have to produce a lot of different kinds of antibodies. And so in the genes, the genes actually shuffle. So the DNA actually rearranges itself um, prior to producing a protein so that there's always new variation being produced. And so it's kind of an interesting thing because it's very much kind of like natural selection occurring within your body, right? And you have to have variation in the production of your antibodies and antibody receptors. So we can talk about the classes of antibodies that are produced, and these are called and also called immunoglobulins. So this is the same thing as antibodies. Right, exactly the same thing. So an immunoglobulin. Why do you think they use the word globulin? Globular protein, excellent. So just globular in proteins that are involved in the immune function. Okay. So this is the whole basis for the Ig, right? So Ig just stands for immunoglobulin. So you might hear that term and you should know that that is the same thing as an antibody. Okay. There are five classes and they can be memorized by the acronym MAG. Okay. Badge does not mean anything. It's just a mnemonic device um, that is used to remember that there are five classes of immunoglobulins. So, for example, we have IgM, IgA, IgD, IgG, and IgE. So just remember MADGE.
So if we look at where these are and their functions, we actually already talked about one of the types of antibodies. So IgA, for example, is in saliva, it's in sweat, and it is in milk, and it crosses the placenta. So when we talk about the uh, first milk or colostrum um, having lots of antibodies in it, we're talking about the IgA antibodies. And this um, infers a type of immunity to the baby that is ingesting the milk. Okay, so I, it's kind of weird, you think, how come they're not broken down in the digestive tract, but that somehow they still are able to function in the, and get into the, the baby's um, circulatory system. IgG, this is the most common in the blood. So this is the by far the most common type of uh, antibody that is just floating around in your blood and is produced. And so when they talk about um, giving somebody an injection of antibodies, Oftentimes, they talk about gamma globulin shots. And when I was a kid, these were very common. But they don't give them anymore, and I'm not sure why. But like if you were a kid and you were sick a lot, what they would do is they would give you shots of IgG proteins and our antibodies, IgG antibodies, in hope that your immune system would be stronger, right? The problem with this, these gamma globulin shots, is this is passive immunity. So as long as they're in your body, they, they work, but they don't um, infer any kind of active immunity or memory. So they do not provide memory. So now oftentimes, or sometimes I think they use them um, during times of war, so let's say they, they know they're going to send people into um, a foreign country and they might um, give them gamma, gamma globulin shots beforehand so that the, they have a little bit of immunity towards the types of microbes they are going to um, see in the field, right? So that gamma globulin shots is sometimes given um, to troops that are going into war. IgE. This is the one that um, is responsible for allergies, which is generally not a good thing, right? But they are also responsible for multicellular parasites, so protection against multicellular parasites. So let's say you have a tapeworm in your body, right? You would produce IgE antibodies in response to that. And so we do have a mechanism to fight off parasitic infections that um, are um, not caused by uh, bacteria or viruses. IgD, this is the one, this is the type of one that, uh, type of immunoglobulin that is a B cell receptor. So what that means is, is that these get inserted into the plasma membrane of the B cells. So B cells can directly detect foreign antigens. And so that's important. The IgM, and I didn't leave much room here, the IgM is the one that is responsible for the primary response. So it's found in tissues, not maybe in the blood, in tissues. And it is the primary response. So that would be as soon as something's gotten in, right, to the, or broken through the barrier, say you get injured and you get um, a bacteria into your body, it's the IgM that are going to be involved in that re primary response. IgG is generally secondary response. So after IgM has, um, that it's staying in the IgG plays a, a big role in secondary response. So this is the what they look like. Okay. 
And so the IgM is kind of interesting because unlike the other ones, it is a pentamere. So we have five different Y molecules uh, covalently bonded together. And notice it, however, only makes about 6% of the antibodies in your blood, right? But it's best at kind of um, fixing um, uh, those complement proteins. So if it binds to a bacteria, then complement proteins will come and bind. And remember the complement proteins are involved in producing holes that will eventually cause cell lysis. So these days, these don't have them. I think they have them in maybe, I'm not sure what order. They don't have them in the MAG order, okay? This is the IgG, right? This is the one that is most common, main antibody. It neutralizes toxins as well. IgA is actually two. You don't need to know that. It's a dimer. IgG and IgD. So the D one is the receptor on the surface of B cells. Okay. So we can talk about how antibodies act because they don't directly destroy bacteria, for example. So they have to have a mechanism by which they can cause the bacteria to ultimately die or a cancer cell to ultimately die, right? And so this has an acronym that I like as well, which is called PLAN, a mnemonic device just to memorize or the, the different types of mechanisms. Okay, so the first one is precipitation. So this means that it comes out of solution. So let's say that we have a neurotoxin in the body and it is in solution and traveling throughout the body. This antibody could bind to it and cause the toxin to come out of the solution, right? So can cause toxins to come out of solution. Lysis, that means to rupture, right? So hydrolysis would be rupturing using water. So this actually means that it, it binds complement proteins. And this has a name, it's called opsonization. Opsonization. It binds those complement proteins. And then the complement proteins produce holes. So we'll just put holes are produced. And this causes the cells to rupture. Agglutination. This is something we studied in Biology 231 when we were talking about um, the different types of blood types. So that IgM can actually bind to foreign red blood cells that are of the wrong type and cause them to agglutinate, which means that it just causes them to clump, right? And then that clumping kind of inactivates them as well. So this is what happens during a transfu transfusion reaction. where you have the wrong type of blood. Right? But agglutination could also happen if there was like lots of bacteria, then the bacteria could clump, right? So it could cause the clumping of bacteria as well. No. So it generally does not cause platelets to adhere. So platelets and fibrin are what cause blood clotting, remember from, from the blood lectures. And so the platelets don't clump or they, they, don't, they don't adhere to this. Right? I guess it would cause a thickening of the blood and it would also attract white blood cells to this area. So this also attracts leukocytes.
So that's why it's one of the primary, um, the IgM is one of the primary responses because it can cause agglutination. And then we have neutralization. Right? So they prevent bacteria from reproducing or producing toxins. So bacteria want to be able to use the body and, its, and nutrition from the body, right? It destroys the tissue so that nutrients are released into the fluid so that they could use those nutrients to reproduce, right? So prevent bacteria from reproducing or causing harm. So then they just kind of sit there until a macrophage or some other phagocyte will come on board to um, engulf it and to digest it. So those are some of the functions of the antibodies. Okay. So we talked about clonal selection already, but this is a diagram that shows that we have different types of B cells. So notice that the B cells have specific receptors. So this is very similar to the diagram that I gave you in lab, right? And then the B cells undergo cell division, and these are the plasma cells. That is just the endoplasmic reticulum that is involved in producing and secreting antibodies. That's why they look like that. And that we produce memory cells that reside in our body long-term. So this is actually the basis for um, vaccinations. So if we look at vaccinations, oops, yeah, we'll talk about this first and I'll show you the image in a minute. Okay, so vaccinations are adaptive immunity or sometimes referred to as active immunity. So I'll put not passive. So passive means that you're not going to learn, that there'll be no memory produced. But with vaccinations, what you want is memory being produced, right? So they are what is referred to as adaptive or active immunity, okay? So um, we can look at the different types of vaccinations and we can talk about um, uh, what is actually being presented but they can contain live and weakened microbes. So this actually has a name and it is said to be attenuated. So an attenuated vaccine is one that um, has uh, live microorganisms, but they're weakened so they actually cannot cause the disease. And so um, this is, uh, for example, sometimes the flu virus can be this, but uh, excuse me, the flu vaccine, but mostly the flu vaccine is inactive, but the measles, mumps, and rubella are this. Oops, mumps. Okay, so that's a shot that they generally give together, right? Um, the flu shots, or the flu vaccine, is generally inactivated virus. So the virus actually is become inactivated, so it is unable to reproduce and cause, dis cause the disease. We can also look at um, toxins. So like for example, tetanus and diphtheria, which is a diarrheal disease. We give pieces of the toxins. So this is, these are both bacteria that produce toxins that cause the disease. Tetanus is a neurotoxin and diphtheria causes um, diarrhea. So we give the body, when we, in the vaccine, there would be pieces of that toxin. 
And then a piece of the toxin would be when we look at hepatitis B and HPV. So HPV is a new vaccine, right? This stands for human papilloma virus. And so this is the virus that is very common in our population, probably worldwide population. And this is what can cause cervical cancer or other types of reproductive cancers. So the PAP here the, would be like a PAP smear, which is used to detect um, uh, uh, cells that are on the cervix that might be infected with the virus and becoming cancerous. So this is our human papilloma virus. So it's a, a sexually transmitted virus that can lead to cervical cancers. And so there has been quite a bit of um, press media trying to get people to vaccinate their children prior to them becoming reproductive. And so that would be like 10, 11, 12, right? go in and get your HPV, and then that's going to protect you for the rest of your life against this virus. And so you could foresee sometime in the future where females will not be, um, you know, it will not be recommended that they get pap smears on a regular basis because there will not be no need for it. Are there any questions about that one? So this is pieces of the microbes or pieces of the viruses. Okay, so there is kind of a really interesting history behind vaccinations. And so I'm going to show you um, a little video, a little cartoon video that specifically talks about smallpox right? and the use of a similar virus um, that um, is not as deadly or does not cause a deadly disease in humans and that would be called the cowpox. And so how you can use something that is similar in another species as a vaccine for a disease that is um, very um, bad in humans. Okay. Oops, what happened here? There we go. Ten thousand years ago, a deadly virus arose in northeastern Africa. The virus spread through the air, attacking the skin cells, bone marrow, spleen, and lymph nodes of its victims. The unlucky infected developed fevers, vomiting, and rashes. Thirty percent of infected people died during the second week of infection. Survivors bore scars and scabs for the rest of their lives. Smallpox had arrived. In 1350 BC, the first smallpox epidemics hit during the Egypt-Hittite War. Egyptian prisoners spread smallpox to the Hittites, which killed their king and devastated his civilization. Insidiously, smallpox made its way around the world via Egyptian merchants, then through the Arab world with the Crusades, and all the way to the Americas, with the Spanish and Portuguese conquests. Since then, it has killed billions of people, with an estimated 300 to 500 million people killed in the 20th century alone. But smallpox is not unbeatable. In fact, the fall of smallpox started long before modern medicine. It began all the way back in 1022 AD. According to a small book called The Correct Treatment of Smallpox, a Buddhist nun living in a famous mountain named Ome Shan in the southern province of Sichuan, would grind up smallpox scabs and blow the powder into nostrils of healthy people. She did this after noticing that those who managed to survive smallpox never got it again, and her odd treatment worked. The procedure, called variolation, slowly evolved, and by the 1700s, doctors were taking material from sores and putting them into healthy people through four or five scratches on the arm. This worked pretty well, as inoculated people would not get reinfected but it wasn't foolproof. Up to 3% of people would still die after being exposed to the pus. 
It wasn't until English physician Edward Jenner noticed something interesting about dairy maids that we got our modern solution. At age 13, while Jenner was apprenticed to a country surgeon and apothecary in Sodbury, near Bristol, he heard a dairy maid say, I shall never have smallpox for I have had cowpox. I shall never have an ugly pockmarked face. Cowpox is a skin disease that resembles smallpox and infects cows. Later on, as a physician, he realized that she was right. Women who got cowpox didn't develop the deadly smallpox. Smallpox and cowpox viruses are from the same family. But when a virus infects an unfamiliar host, in this case cowpox infecting a human, it is less virulent. So Jenner decided to test whether the cowpox virus could be used to protect against smallpox. In May 1796, Jenner found a young dairy maid, Sarah Nelms, who had fresh cowpox lesions on her hand and arm, caught from the udders of a cow named Blossom. Using matter from her pustules, he inoculated James Phipps, the eight-year-old son of his gardener. After a few days of fever and discomfort, the boy seemed to recover. Two months later, Jenner inoculated the boy again, this time with matter from a fresh smallpox lesion. No disease developed, and Jenner concluded that protection was complete. His plan had worked. Jenner later used the cowpox virus in several other people and challenged them repeatedly with smallpox, proving that they were immune to the disease. With this procedure, Jenner invented the smallpox vaccination. Unlike variolation, which used actual smallpox virus to try to protect people, vaccination used the far less dangerous cowpox virus. The medical establishment, cautious then as now, deliberated at length over his findings before accepting them. But eventually, vaccination was gradually accepted and variolation became prohibited in England in 1840. After large vaccination campaigns throughout the 19th and 20th centuries, the World Health Organization certified smallpox's eradication in 1979. Jenner is forever remembered as the father of immunology. But let's not forget the dairy maid Sarah Nelms, Blossom the Cow, and James Phipps, all heroes in this great adventure of vaccination who helped eradicate smallpox. Okay, so um, what is the controversy over vaccinations? People think they're toxic to them, is that what we said? Like some that autism. Oh, autism. So there was a paper that um, was presented or presented the idea that the MMR, the measles, mumps, and rubella, was linked to or had a, people that had that, that particular um, vaccine were more likely to get autism. And um, since then, when they tried to replicate that and actually look at that study, that study was kind of discredited because it didn't wasn't valid. There wasn't a lot of um, uh, good analysis there. And so that one paper kind of did a lot of damage to um, vaccinations in modern day. However, there are some risks, right? So if we look at the risks, One risk is this, that you will have an allergic response. Okay. So I know a, um, a friend of mine whose child, when they gave her vaccinations in the hospital, when the newborn was given vaccinations, she actually had an allergic response. So she went into anaphylactic shock and they had to give her shots of um, adrenaline epinephrine in order to um, to prevent her from dying. And so there's always the possibility when you present your body with something foreign that you're gonna have an allergic response and this could actually lead to death, okay? So there is a risk there. The other risk is, is that you could get the disease, right? So could get disease. But this is only if we're looking at weakened, right? So if it is caused by a weakened version, then a weakened virus is inserted to you, into you. Generally, it's not going to make you as sick as if you were exposed to the, to the, the strong, right, the normal virus. So it would be a, a weakened version of it. So people are, sometimes they get a flu shot and they're like, you know, I feel like crap. But it's not that they don't actually get the 
flu. It's just that you might feel kind of run down because of that initial immune response can cause um, some symptoms that make you feel sick, right? So that could be another thing is the immune response. Could make you feel ill. There's also some um, idea that if you have a propensity towards autoimmune diseases, that you should not get some vaccines. So for example, um, in my family, somebody got Guillain-Barre, which is uh, an autoimmune disease where the immune system attacks the um, Schwann cells uh, that are associated with the nerve cells, so they attacks the nervous system. And so they recommend that um, people that have a known history of that do not get the flu shot because sometimes the flu shot can be a precursor to autoimmune diseases. So in some people, vaccines be a precursor to autoimmune diseases. So autoimmune means that your immune system attacks normal, healthy tissue. Then there was a lot of controversy over a mercury preservative. So we know that mercury is a neurotoxin. And so there was some concern. It's actually a form of mercury called thimerosal. So it's not like, you know, taking mercury from a thermometer and putting it into the solution, right? So thimerosal is just a form of mercury, which is a preservative in things like the flu vaccine. So this is um, all the vaccines that come from one bottle. So if you have like a big bottle of vaccines and you're vaccinating many people in order to preserve it, so it's multi-dose, they use thimerosal. And so many doctors actually went away from multi using multi-dose bottles in this instance and started using single-use bottles. And so every patient gets it, its own bottle and therefore you don't have to have the thimerosal in the, um, as a preservative in the vaccination. Are there any other questions about vaccines and possible risks of vaccines? So if we look at what happens during a vaccination and also, you know, just what happens um, after you have been exposed, this is a diagram that shows over time the concentration of concentrations of antibodies um, in your body. So the first time you are um, infected with a bacteria or the when you get a vaccination, so let's say I get the chickenpox vaccine here. So this is my initial exposure because I was vaccinated. I'm going to have a primary response where my antibody concentration goes up. But when I am re-exposed to it, so let's say I actually come in contact with somebody who has the chickenpox virus, notice how the secondary immune response is quicker, but it is also um, accelerates the production of antibodies. And the reason for that would be what? What in your what do you have in your body here that causes your body to respond so much more quickly than you did in the primary response? You have memory cells. So you have memory B cells and memory T cells, and those can actually cause the response to become um, accelerated, right? And so some in some cases with vaccinations, they give you what is called a booster shot. And so what is the booster shot boosting here? The immune response, but specifically the concentration of antibodies, right? So a booster shot is a second exposure 
this increases the concentration of antibodies that are specific to that antigen. Now, sometimes the flu vaccine does not work because they, um, sometimes they do not figure out exactly what strain is going to be the most common one. So the problem with the flu vaccines is, is that the, back, the flu virus is constantly mutating. And so we have uh, um, uh, people, epidemiologists who study disease and they try to figure out what is going to be the major flu virus that is going to be deadly um, to specifically to children and to uh, older adults and then also to people with compromised immune systems and then they kind of just make a call that this is the these are the viruses that are going to be present in the vaccine but sometimes um, they get it wrong right and so there can actually be a a, a type of virus or flu virus that is not part of the vaccine and can still make you sick. And so there's, you can still get the flu even though you have been vaccinated because you might be exposed to a mutated form of the flu virus um, or a, a form of the virus that they did not include in the vaccine. And so that's why you have to get your flu shots every year because the flu virus is, is such a highly mutating virus. Okay, I think I'm going to stop there for today, and we're going to finish the immune system on Monday. So we'll talk about allergies and autoimmune diseases. I'm not going to grab a hole.